Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Welcome all of our campuses, everybody online. What a joy to have you. I'm Jared. I get to be the senior pastor here, so a wonderful joy to have you. And we are in a series called Overwhelmed, where we're looking at different topics and issues that have to do with our daily lives. So a big one today. Let me pray, and we'll dig in. Let's pray together. Lord, we need you and pray in the name of Jesus that you'll open the eyes of our heart to your word, open our heart to your word, our eyes, our, our minds, our, our, our souls. So many have walked in here and are under the sound of my voice, navigating pain and confusion and anger. And so, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit set us free today. Help us see you more than all. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're tackling depression today, and uh, I've been pretty transparent over the last 14 years of my own personal battle from late teens into my young adult years in the past decades, coming with an official diagnosis, a form of a diagnosis in 2004, and having to live with that for all these years, and then had quite an event in 2014. Christy said it was as if I had a heart attack in my brain and fell into a, just a catastrophic depression. I had to take some time to, to recalibrate and take some space, but God was good in it, and he's still good in it today. And I think of how many more, you know, walk through this depression, and it doesn't have to be uh, catastrophic. It doesn't have to be a 10 out of 10. I mean, you can go through it when it's a 1 out of 10 or a 2 out of 10, I know for me, I, I, I always sit around a one or a two, and then seasons change, and it might bump up to a four, and, and that's just the way it is. Now, for, again, the rest of us, it may not be something you carry, but can come at different times, such as it can be circumstantial, it could be something sinful in your life that you haven't confessed and repented of, and it's, it's bringing a, a depression, a darkness into your life. It could be something relational going on in your marriage or at work or with your children. It could be seasonal. S season changes can have an impact on different people. Biological issues, whether it's a chemical imbalance or postpartum depression, that kind of thing. Or it can be spiritual and you feel forsaken and God is gone in your life. Or it can be unexplainable. And that's one of the toughest ones of all. I don't think I have to make a case that we are in a mental health crisis as a country. And even right here in Orange County, I learned this week to get a psychiatric appointment, you are put on an 18-month waiting list. And so this is very, very important for all of us, whether you're walking through something or you know someone is walking through something. So I pray the Lord will speak to your heart today as we turn to the scriptures, and that's where we do turn to see what God has to say to our souls that may be navigating any darkness in our lives. And I would say if you're in that place, you're not in bad company. I mean, you go to the scriptures, you find Elijah, who is one of the greatest prophets ever, that God, he called out to God and God brought down fire to burn up sacrifices to, def to defeat the false worship, uh, for worship, worshipers of, of Baal. And later on, he, went, he got so depressed that he wanted God to take his life. And then we see Jonah was the same way, a big prophet. He wanted God to take his life. We see Jeremiah, who was a prophet. He was called the weeping prophet. And then you get on over into the, and then there's Job, of course, Job who lost everything. And he, he had called out to God and said, I wish I'd never been born. And then you get to the New Testament, you have the apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament where he would say, uh, under the pressures he was under, he said, I despaired even of life. And we would see where he would make remarks like, I prefer to depart and be with the Lord, yet God has me here for a reason. And then you get to Jesus himself, who was called a man of sorrows. So God knows about this frailty that we can carry in our lives when it comes to this heaviness, this darkness. And so we turn to Psalm 42, where we see David, King David, warrior David. And he is depressed in Psalm 42. When I go into the darkness, I turn to Psalm 42, and that's what I wanted to kind of hug you with today, with Psalm 42. David, in, in this Psalm alone, 11, 11 verses, he, he asks questions nine times toward the Lord. So there's this, and we don't know what's happening to him either. I, I looked at different commentators, and no one can really nail down what he's going through. It's not sin. 
So that much we, we know there's something else and we don't know, which I, I'm, I'm glad because now it applies to all of us in ways, whether it's spiritual, chemical, seasonal, or unexplainable. We look at Elijah, we look at all these different prophets, then we look to David and David never apologizes for the darkness he's in and how he expresses it. He's, he confesses it without wavering. And I want to remind us of that to our men today is that, again, David was a great king. He was a great warrior. He killed giants. He could take other warriors on and take them out with his bare hands. He had the toughest men alive who would go to the death for him. And yet he not only struggled with depression, but he confessed it and was very transparent about it. Because I know in my years of battling with depression, I just thought how I, was, I must be weak I saw it as a weakness, and a weakness that I was to carry on my own and never share with anybody my weakness. But I've learned over time, by God's grace and looking at the scriptures, the weakness is holding it in. The strength is when you're transparent about it, because that's where God can work with it. More on that in a moment. So Psalm 42, what I did, I went and looked up, let me see if I can say it right. It's the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's updated version where it talks about depression and symptoms of depression. And this version, it gives nine symptoms. And the manual says, if you have at least five of these symptoms, then you would be diagnosed with depression. So I read them and I looked at David's life just in Psalm 42, and he has seven out of those nine symptoms out of that manual. So I'm not going to name the symptoms and all that. I just We're going to see the symptoms as we read through it, and then we're going to see what we're to do about it. So let's see how real David is with us as he pours his heart out to the Lord. Psalm 42, verse 1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So here we have something deep. It's from the soul. It's something spiritual here. He's saying, God, I don't see you like I once did. I don't feel you like I once did. Verse 3, my tears have been my food. My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? So he's crying day and night. This is frequent crying. There's a loss of his appetite. He calls his tears his food. He can't sleep. Day and night, he can't sleep. Or maybe he can't sleep during the night, and then he's a zombie during the day, and he goes back to sleep and still can't sleep at night, and he's a zombie during the day. Anybody? Anybody? I've been there. That's a vicious, vicious cycle that wears on your mind and your heart. Verse 4, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, pouring out his soul. This is something emotional. It's something spiritual, and he's exhausted. How, would I go, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping Festival. So he speaks of having been with God's people, but now he feels so lonely and he feels so isolated. Verse 5 Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why? He doesn't have an explanation of what he's going through. There's no reason. He can't figure it out. And why are you in turmoil within me? Turmoil that's sorrow, despair, rage, anger, all of that can be a part of depression. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Again, sorrow, sadness, hopelessness. He says, therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Massar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, and all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. He's saying, I'm overwhelmed by life circumstances. I can barely get up in the morning. I'm suffocating here. He says, I'm pinned down. I have no peace, no ease. I'm helpless. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Verse 10, as with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Deadly wound in my bones. That's physical. So there's something physical that's ca that could be causing the depression or depression often can bring physical problems. 
chronic pains, exhaustion, problems like, like that. Verse 11, why are you cast down? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So if you walked in here today, okay, I probably just depressed you already. We ain't even got the sermon going. And already with David, it's kind of heavy, but there's something beautiful we see here with David. We see him fighting through depression. And that's what you got to do, y'all. You got to fight through it. Depression is one of those things you just don't get over it. You, you got to go through it and fight through it as you go. So let's see how David fought through it and how we're to fight through it. First of this, and we always see this with David, you vent to God. Pour out your heart to God. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? What an image. My soul, I'm a deer and my soul pants for God. That's thirsty, y'all. When you are, if you've ever had those moments, maybe it's in the middle of the night, you, woke, you wake up and you are dying of thirst. What's all you can think about is water. David is saying, I'm so depressed that all I can think about is what I can do to quench this in me. And he's realizing ultimately it's God. So I'm going to vent to God about it. So he, he goes, I like how he says as a deer. He doesn't say as a camel. Because if you look up a camel, a camel can be pretty self-sufficient in the desert. Google them. They're amazing. And they can, they have, they're self-sufficient in the sense that they can store a lot of water and make it through. And David is saying, I have no sufficiency in myself. I have no help for myself. Where we might turn to find a way to uh, be self-sufficient in our way. We can turn to substances, whether it's alcohol or pot or whatever it may be. Or you turn to the show or the movie or, or, or you distract yourself and just stay busy and, and, and not deal with what's at, at, at the heart of it. But that pain is always going to be there. If you use a substance to escape the pain, that substance is going to wear off and the pain is going to be sitting there waving at you. Matter of fact, it'll probably make the pain worse. So David is saying, there's nothing in me, nothing around me. I need him. I thirst for God. Psalm 42, 3, my tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? And as with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Here twice he's saying, where is your God? He speaks of an enemy and there are enemies that speak to you and speak to me. When you're down for the count, so to speak, it's like a hyena that notices in a herd, there's always the one who is weak and limp, and that's where the hyena goes after. It's the same way with the devil, Satan, the adversary. Revelation, he's called the accuser of God's people. So he accuses you. He accuses you of shame and of, and of guilt. And then in Genesis 2, we see that he can accuse God to you, that God is not good. He's forgotten you. He's forsaken you. And so this is what David seems to be listening to. And it's only the enemy that, that enemy that can be uh, whispering to you. It can be your own heart that's lying to you. When I was a youth pastor way back in the day in the late 90s, I was going through a dark time and I just didn't know what it was at the time. And this wonderful lady just came to me and she said, Jared, I had a dream about you. And I'm, oh boy, here we go. You know, you get one of those, you're like, I better brace myself. <laughs> but what's about to happen here? And she said, I had a dream that you were sitting at a desk and you had the Bible open and there were people lined up around the building coming to you and you would listen to them and then you would flip through your Bible and you would tear a page out and hand it to them. And the next person would come and you would listen and you flip through your Bible and you tear a page out and you would hand it to them. And she said, a man walked in to where you were and he had a huge cage with a beast that was just frothing and at the mouth and growling and, and roaring just out of control. It brought it, sat it down on the other side of the wall, opened the cage up, and it leapt out and turned into a man. And she said, then went past the people and came to you and just leaned over and started talking to you in your ear. And as he talked to you, you let go of the Bible and you just dropped your head down as if you were completely defeated. And she said, Jared, I don't know what that means, but the Lord wanted me to tell you that. And I want you to know that the Lord loves you. Amen. Boy, that was huge, man. 
That was huge. And it was such a picture for me, even through the darkness now, that's what the enemy can do and what he can do to you. He can come to you and he can whisper to you that which only you, the words you recognize for your own soul, that, that, that shame and the guilt that really gets you. Or what's questioned about God, does he even exist? Is he really there? Does he even really care? And all that can come and lie to you. And at the same time, your own heart can lie to you. Your heart can condemn you. Did you know that? Your, your own heart, you, you can be your own enemy. And that's why 1 John 3, 20 says, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. And he knows everything. So when that happens, whenever the enemy comes, you just say, Lord, you have defeated the enemy. He's a liar, and you are the truth teller, and you are my God, and I am your child. I am not forgotten. Then you look at your heart, and you say, heart, who made you king over me? Heart, who made you God over me? Who made you judge over me? God is greater than you, heart, and he I will listen to. That's how you fight back. You vent to God. Heard the story of Alexander the Great, the great warrior king, and when he was a young man, he uh, chose a horse who he named Bucephalus. He ended up being one of the greatest war horses in history. When you read about Alexander the Great, Bucephalus, his horse, will be in that story somewhere. Great warrior horse. But the horse was chaotic and wild and out of control, and no one could figure out how to tame him until Alexander the Great figured out if he could take Bucephalus and point him toward the sun, it brought a calm over him, and then they would off they would go. That's what David is doing here with God. He's taking his wild, chaotic, dark heart, and he's aiming it toward the sun, venting to God. And that's what we are to do as well, to fight through depression. So here's, here's where you, you choice you make. You can sit in the depression and just be miserable, been there. You can choose substances to escape, or you can keep yourself busy and distracted till you run yourself to death, been there. Or you can cry out to God the one who will listen, who will listen to you. And let's see how it happens as we keep going. Fight through depression by venting to God. Secondly, trust God's sovereign love. We may spend an extra minute or so here because this is a big one. Psalm 42, five and six. Hope in God for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Now look at that for just a minute. He said, hope in God, I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And then in the same, same breath, he goes, my soul is downcast. That's the way of humanity. Praise God, and then my soul is downcast. That's the way of depression. One minute you're good, next minute you're not good. One minute you feel like you got your bearings, next minute you're having a tough go of it. So it was with David. But he says, I shall again praise him. What a hopeful, hopeful truth. I shall again praise him. Meaning, I'm going to get through this. Meaning, this too will pass. And it's hard to know in the time, times that you're going through. And that's why you go to God's truth and be reminded that he's going to get you there. He's going to get you through it as you fight through it. Psalm 42 verse 1, it says that David is panting. He's going through a drought. And now we see that He's, in, he's drowning. Psalm 42, 7, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Now look at that closely. Deep calls to deep at the roar of what? Your waterfalls, your breakers, your waves have gone over me. It's almost as if he's saying, God, you brought this to me. You, either you allowed it or you caused it or you've done it, but you could stop it. But it's your doing, your waves, your breakers. Therefore, he's saying, if it's your bra waves and breakers that I'm plunged into, then it must mean you are here with me. Hope is not the absence of suffering. Hope is the presence of your Savior, Jesus He's with you in the roaring and hissing and booming waterfalls that you may feel that you're drowning under, but you can trust what he's up to because of his sovereign love. Psalm 42, 8, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. 
So in the same breath, he says, your breakers and your waves, he says, but your steadfast love is with me. So there's something loving going on. And I would ask myself the question, does it bring me, does it bring you any comfort to think that God's not in the waves and the breakers that you go through? That would be terrifying to me. But to know that God did it, God brought it, God's allowed it, it must mean there is truly a purpose in it because it's from his steadfast love. So that would mean then when you're going through it, it's never without a purpose. And, and that really gets to the heart of the battle. Is, is there a purpose in this somewhere? And the answer is yes. God could be preparing you for something greater ahead of you he wants to use you in. God may be humbling you for blessings to come that you cannot handle unless you go through this. There are joys before you and ahead of you that you cannot comprehend unless you go through the sorrow. Maybe it's God wants you to experience him in ways you would never fathom unless you go through the darkness. Paul knew this, the apostle Paul, who despaired even of life. And then he showed us the rawness of, of a situation he was working through in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Watch this. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming arrogant, conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So he's saying it may be a messenger of Satan, but it's the Lord who's in this. Because he's, that's why he's praying to the Lord. And notice he's saying, three times I prayed to the Lord, pleaded Anything but this, take this away from me. I can barely get out of the bed in the morning. I can barely function through my day, Lord. Anything but this, please, please, please stop this. Ever been there? Yeah. So was Paul. And I would think the Lord would be like, oh, Paul, I love you, and your prayer is answered. That's how I think God would respond because that's how I would respond. My child, I mean, my kids have said, God, uh, dad, why won't God answer me? And I've said to them, if I was God, I would totally answer you, but I'm not. And he's good. He's better than I am. I have three pound gray matter. He's infinite in his wisdom. So there's something about this that is a purpose in this that God has for you. And if you can't see it now, it must be coming. So does, so does God answer Paul and say, prayer answered, I'll take it from you? No. Verse 9, but God said to me, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you're going to experience me in ways you could not fathom because of what you've got to walk through. And that's really what you want in the deepest part of your soul. My grace, my divine enablement is enough for you. And I wonder if God's saying along with that, Paul, I will not take your thorn from you because can you imagine what a jerk you would become? You would become so conceited and so arrogant. Or how about this one? Paul, if I took this thorn away from you, you might walk away from me. And I love you too much for that. So Paul said, well, well then, <laughs> therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Somebody once said that God will either make your burden lighter or your backbone stronger. And God's grace is in the backbone too, isn't it? Now listen, here's where my heart is for many of you. I just know where I've sat at times hearing something like this. And it could be you hear this and you go, I wish, I wish. Or you hear it and it make you angry. Been there too. So let me encourage your heart to say, if it's hard for you to receive this in any way, receive it the best way you can as a vision of what lies ahead of you, a vision of what God's going to do in you and going to do before you. Trust him, trust him, vent to his heart, and then trust his sovereign love even when you don't feel it. 
Thirdly, the way to fight through depression is you got to stay with God's people or get with God's people. Get with God's people. Psalm 42, 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. So he's in his darkness, and he's looking back when he was with God's people, and he says, it was so wonderful there. There were needs met there that I miss now. It's truly something that second only to missing the presence of God is missing the presence of God's people. And this is scientific, really, in a way, about community. I mean, you do the science. Of course, to, to battle depression in your life, you got to watch your diet. Sugar can often be the enemy. Oh, the fall of Adam and Eve. The sugar is the enemy. <laughs> Uh, it could be diet. It could be you got to move your body. You got to make a way to exercise. Go for a walk, 30, 45 minutes a day or so. Move your body. Sleep. As far as it's up to you, you got to fight for your sleep. Put the phone down and the cat memes away for 2 a.m. All right. Get to sleep. Also, it may mean you need to see a doctor. You, you need to see what's going on. There's no shame in that. And it may mean you need medication. And those are all gifts of God. Maybe the medication is not a life sentence. Maybe it's to get you through 18 months. Maybe it's to get you through the, 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 the dark season of winter. I don't know. But there is no, that is not weakness. That's strength that you would trust and, and, and see how God gives us with it in these ways. But also scientifically, it's you need community. You need to be with people in your life, especially God's people if you are a Christian, because there's something that can't be duplicated watching online. I'm sorry. I'm glad you're tuned in, but you've got to be with God's people. You're missing the fullness of what God would have for you. There's something beautiful about it, and God has wired something supernatural to be in which to be with God's people, and that can be at a coffee shop. That can be inviting people over to your home or, and so forth, but it all, it's also just as important where there are shouts and songs of praise where we're together, because there's something to seeing each other weep. There's something to seeing others who raise up their hands. And I know you see some people raising their hands, you're like, I don't get it, or I'm not there. And that's okay. We look to each other and say, I'm going to get there. And we laugh together, and we lean into each other. Be with God's people. Listen, would you please check in on each other? Check in on each other. See how you're doing. Check in on your family. Check in and be real about what's going on. Men, can I speak to you just for a moment? Men, you need other men in your life. Amen. And if you're a married man, don't hold in the pain. Talk it out with your wife because you're already taking it out on something or somebody. Strength is not holding that in, fellas. Strength is opening up and being transparent about it, especially men with other men. When you come together and you get past weather and sports and the giants, the giants ought to be depressing you right now anyway, so <laughs> get away from the giants, all right? And talk with other men about what's going on in your soul. And of course, you too, ladies. You need, we, need, we have women's ministry here. We have men's ministry here. We have men's groups here. We do men's conferences here and, and women. So get plugged in. We help you. Reach out to us and we will help you as well. I would also say, be careful that you put yourself in a place where you complain of no one reaches out to me and I feel so lonely and I feel so isolated. I've been there. And, and what you've got to understand is that might be more on you than anybody else because you're isolating yourself. And I get why. But an act of worship is when you take that step out and lean into somebody and connect with somebody so they can, they may not know how to talk to you or really what's going on and they don't want to intrude. So you've got to invite that into your life. And then as far as being with God's people, sometimes you just got to obey the Lord and show up. How many times have I heard, I almost didn't come today, but thank God I did. So just obey the Lord sometimes. It's as simple as that because this is a command. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his, Lord, uh, the day of his return is drawing near. So stay and get with God's people. Fourth way to 
fight through depression is offer God a sacrifice of praise. We see this repeated too over the series. He says, my soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. So he's putting his fight for hope to song, to music. He's fighting with music. I love that image. You know, uh, a thousand hallelujahs, begins with the first one. And so you begin with the hallelujah. When you don't feel it, you, especially then it's a sacrifice. Whether I feel it or not, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you. To the choir master, a maskil of the sons of Korah. That's what's listed over Psalm 42. And this is how David provided it as a maskil. Maskil means to instruct and wisdom. So God uses Worship music from his word to minister to you, to give you wisdom in the darkness, and to instruct you in ways we might not understand and how we are to navigate the darkness in the issues of our lives. So in other words, music, the Psalms that are really songs, music gets past your thoughts and your reasoning and your intellect, and it goes straight for your emotions. It goes straight for your soul. Songs, the Psalms can touch your heart in a way a lecture cannot, in a way a sermon cannot. (laughs) So worship music. I have to be very transparent with you that I've been through seasons where I couldn't listen to any music. I couldn't even listen to worship music. So what I did is I would go to the Psalms and I would just read the Psalms, like Psalm 42, and then I would just start humming (laughs) And I would kind of hum my own tune along with Psalm 42. And I remember thinking, "Hmm, God, this is your song to me. It's your word to me. And that's where you turn. When anybody talks with me about depression and what you're walking through, go to the Psalms. Eugene Peterson, great writer, preacher. He was also a scholar. He would have his students, he would assign his students uh, homework to go out into the woods once a day and scream out a psalm to the heavens. So go to the Psalms, and through the Psalms, if you don't have words of praise, let the Psalms be your praise to the Lord. And then finally, preach God's promises to yourself. Preach God's promises to yourself, to your own heart. Psalm 42, 5 and 6, why are you downcast? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me, soul? Hope in God, soul, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So he's saying to himself, he's saying, David, soul, pay attention, soul. And he grabs himself by the collar and he runs himself up to the mirror and he says, soul, you listen to me. You're going through a hard go. Times are dark, but listen, soul, hope in God, hope in God, Hope in God. He is worthy and he is worth it. Hope in God. And then we see how we can hope in God. He says in Psalm 43, which is linked to Psalm 42, God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. So he's saying, God, let your promises bring me closer to you. Light and truth, your promises. Well, what kind of promises? Promises like this, Psalm 34, God is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord and he turned to me and he heard my cry. Psalm 107, I cry unto the Lord and he will save me out of my distress. Psalm 73, you guide me with your counsel and after that you will lead me into glory. And then Psalm 42, he commands his steadfast love to me. His presence is with me in the night and I will again Praise the Lord. Hmm. Someone said this about promises. God's promises are that which comes into your darkness, shines the lights, cuts the ropes, and says, we're here to take you home. And the ultimate promise is the one who gave up his own child for you. And his name is Jesus. He's the ultimate promise. David, who despaired even of life. David, who said, I would rather depart and go be with the Lord. David, who said, God, please, anything but this, take this away from me. This, David declares, if God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's children? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Well, Christ could, but Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or depression or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's the promise. So tell God, how great your darkness is and then tell your darkness how greater your God is. Yeah, let's pray. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We need you. A thousand hallelujahs begins with the first one. So I pray for anyone in the darkness today who finds that hallelujah difficult. May they know one step, one hallelujah and they're on their way and that you give grace sufficient for them divine enablement. May we hear your hope and see the cross past the lies of the enemy. And may we know that our hearts are not the king over us, but you are the king of our hearts. So King Jesus, we praise you. We turn our eyes on you because we know you are our ultimate promise. And you graciously give us all things in yourself. We bless you. We praise you. We need you. And in these few minutes we have together, be glorified for you are our king. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. We all said amen. Amen.